Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, this is a really, really exciting event. So before we get started, I just wanted to introduce um, who we are and what we do. So seven months ago, uh, which isn't crazy, it's only been seven months, but we had the idea, um, Michael, I, and Mustafa, and the friends who tied the lawn, Gabriel and Sophia and Marcus, um, we started a neurotech group on campus um, that incorporated a lot of interdisciplinary technology from various different fields of study to create a space for students and for non-students even to come together to build and learn and do projects relating to neurotech. And as part of that, um, within that course of eight months, we have not only been able to host weekly meetings, speakers, but also have a hacker house over the summer where we actually came together in a house on campus or near campus to just simply work on neurotech projects. And we had people rolling in from around the country in the world, um, places as far as Germany and Canada. But um, without further ado, let me let Michael introduce um, Carl Friston. Hi, thank you, Zan. Um, and hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's event. Dr. Friston is a towering figure in the field of neuroscience. He is the inventor of statistical parametric mapping, which is a cornerstone tool for modern neuroimaging analysis. And he is the former president of the International Organization of Human Brain Mapping. Semantic Scholar ranked him as the most influential neuroscientist in the world, and he currently focuses his efforts around the theoretical frameworks for cognition that he developed called Active Inference and the Free Energy Principle. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carl Frisson. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. It's also very nice of you to invite me to speak to you. Um, let me just... One second, sorry. No problem. I'm going to be made a co-host, so I can share my screen with you. Yes. There we are. Should be off there. Can you pin? Yeah. Oh. Excellent. So let me just repeat my uh, my thanks for, for inviting me to talk to you. Um, I generally start this talk with an apology. Um, it's going to be a bit dense, and um, I'm told that you need to say it three times before the simplicity of the message um, reveals itself. Um, this is going to be my basic talk, going right back to basic principles um, of how we make sense of the world and how we decide what to do next. Um, it's dense in the, in the sense that I'm going to appeal to um, a heuristic kind of physics and going to use equations. But for those people who don't like equations, you can regard them as icons that just demonstrate some nice mathematical symmetries um, when trying to interpret our sense making and decision making. So we're going to be talking about active inference in the brain. And the talk's basically going to have two parts. I'm going to start by addressing the fundaments or the statistics of life as viewed through the eyes of a physicist trying to understand self-organization with a special focus on Markov blankets. And we'll see that these are essential in terms of individuating an artifact or a person or a computer we want to talk about from the rest of the universe in which that uh, artifact is embedded and how the very existence of Markov blankets leads to a, a Bayesian reading of the internal dynamics and computations. I'm then gonna tell exactly the same story, but from the point of view of a neurobiologist. So I'm going to relay the same idea, but using the notions you'd find in neuroscience and psychology, and in particular focusing on predictive coding and how that plays out on neuronal networks and indeed neural networks. And then if we have time, um, I'll turn to a slight denouement, uh, which is um, a new thing in this talk, which is the distinction between different kinds of artifacts or particles or people um, that rests upon whether we model the consequences of our own actions and how that speaks to active inference and agency. 
I will also try to speak quite quickly because I find the most interesting part of this talk are the questions and answers at the end. So I'm going to go through uh, at a hopefully uh, understandable but breathless pace uh, just to get the ideas on the table and then we can talk about them should you want to uh, at the end. So we're going to start with a question posed by Schrodinger. How can the events in space and time which take place within the spatial boundary of a living organism be accounted for by physics and chemistry? And what I want to do here is just pick up on this notion of a spatial boundary and reiterate that if we want to talk about anything, we have to separate that thing from everything else. And that separation here, I'm going to read as a Markov blanket, um, effectively as Schrodinger would be the first to admit a statistical object. So for those of you not familiar with Markov blankets, um, which are um, very useful devices in, say, factographs and the like, um, a Markov blank, well, let's imagine that we've got a little universe here, and all of these circles represent various states, and some states influence other states as denoted by this edge or this arrow. And let's just pick um, a certain set of states, say my states, my internal states. And the blanket states, the Markov blanket states, are effectively the parents, the children, and the parents of the children. And you may be asking, what do these states do? Well, what they do is they provide a kind of insulation or veil or blanket that statistically insulates the inside from the outside. Technically, what this does, um, it means that the internal states are conditionally independent of the external states, given the blanket states. And I'm going to make a further move here. I'm going to divide the blanket states into sensory states and active states, simply on the basis that the sensory states influence but are not influenced by the internal states. And similarly, the active states influence but are not influenced by the external states. Now, you may be wondering why I've partitioned my blanket states into sensory and active states, um, and in so doing, provided a Markov blanket partition where I can now talk about a particle as constituted by the internal states and its uh, blanket states here, which we sometimes refer to as particular states. Why have I done this? Well, if you look at any system, um, and as a biologist here, my, two of my favorite systems, um, a brain and a cell, um, that kind of dependency structure, those edges of the influences um, re-emerge wherever you look. So, for example, in the brain, we could associate the internal states with all my synaptic activities and efficacies, everything that would I would need to list to tell you what the current state of my brain was. And those internal states affect the active states, my actuators, my autonomic reflexes that change my outside world, my external states that could be my body or it could be my extrapersonal space and objects within it. And then they would in turn change so as to supply sensory states that are registered by my sensory epithelia or my sensory organs or uh, that in turn influence the internal states and so what we've done is basically build a dependency structure that allows the inside to talk to the outside vicariously through these blanket states. So the system is open in one sense, but also the internal states are separable or individuated from the external sense, uh, states. So we're talking about an open system of a particular sort. In fact, one could argue that the only sort of system that can be separated in that sense. And exactly the same dependency structure can be found in say single cells where the intracellular states could be the internal states and the Active states could be the actin filaments that support the cell surface or sensory states that are pushed into the external milieu that change things outside, that are registered by cell surface receptors that change the internal states, and so on. Again, recapitulating this circular causality or this um, universal kind of action perception uh, cycle. So that's what a Markov blanket is. What I want you to do now is forget about the Markov blanket. We're do, going to do a crash course in physics. The idea being just to lift out uh, one fundamental behavior we get from uh, the physics of dynamical systems and then put the Markov blanket back into play and see what kind of special consequences ensue from that, that we can then apply to things or particle or particles or people. So 
what uh, what kind of physics are we talking about? Well, a very generic kind of physics. Um, I'm I've written down here a Langevin equation or a random dynamical system. And what I mean by this is a system that has a certain set of attracting states, technically a pullback attractor. Um, here I've cartooned this in terms of the trajectory of states that uh, a system might take um, as it evolves in time. So this could be my states and it could be any scale. It could be uh, oscillations in one of my brain cells over a few hundred milliseconds. It could be me. It could be my heartbeat, for example, going through the different cardiac phases. It could be me getting up in the morning, uh, doing my emails, having a cup of coffee and so on. It could be Christmas, Easter, summer holidays. The key point is at any particular scale, in any subspace of this um, of this state space, I keep on coming back to states that I once visited. And those states constitute this attracting set that characterize the kind of thing that I am. And another way of looking at this is that this object can be regarded as a probability density over the kind of states that characterize me. So if you sample me at random, you're more likely to find me in this regime of, the, of state space, um, uh, but never um, will you find me um, outside my attracting set over here. So the idea is we have this very itinerant structure that can be described in terms of a probability distribution over my states or the states that I occupy, given I am me. Um, that sort of um, persistent and, and return, and the fact that um, I always keep within my characteristic states um, means that this probability density in and of itself does not change with time or over a suitable period of time. And that's the key move. Um, because from physics, we can just write down the density dynamics of any object that whose dynamics, whose flow that is subject to random fluctuations, omega, is described by this equation where x is the rate of change of my states. And if I know this equation, then this is true. This just describes the rate of change of this probability distribution. It's known as the Fokker Planck equation or the time independent Schrodinger in wave equation. You may notice a master equation. And it crucially just describes the rate of change of this distribution, this density, in terms of the amplitude of the random fluctuations and the flow here. Now, we can forget about this because we, we've just said this probability density is not changing. So we know this is zero, which means that we can now express the flow in terms of the gradients of the log of this probability. Um, the, slightly more complicated than that due to this Helmholtz decomposition in the sense that I can always decompose the flow into a gradient flow that's essentially climbing up the probability gradients in a way that counters the dispersion of the uh, my states uh, due to these random fluctuations. Um, but there's another component at right angles to that, orthogonal to that, which is basically circulating around the isocontours of this probability density distribution. So there's a sort of dissipative and a conservative solenoidal part, um, which we'll all be familiar with um, I've cartooned that here in terms of water flowing uh, down a plug hole. So the gradient flow um, minimizing, as we'll see later, a free energy uh, functional um, is accompanied also by this circular um, conservative solenoidal flow. But what I want to do is just focus on this gradient flow here um, and um, ask now, OK, if this is how things that exist in the sense of having characteristic states over time behave, what does that mean if, if a system has a Markov blanket and something living with inside it? Um, so that flow, that um, generalized gradient descent is still in play and it pertains both to the internal states and the active states in a way that doesn't depend by construction on the external states. So we can write down a mathematical flow for what I'm going to sell as perception and action, namely the dynamics, the rate of change of internal states and active states here. And they both will look as if they're performing a gradient ascent or descent, uh, sorry, ascent here on this log probability of, say, the sensory sector of my Markov blanket, given I am me. So how can we interpret this? Well. I've given a few interpretations here that speak to sort of 
global theories of self-organization and brain theories and computation uh, that I'm sure most of you will recognize immediately. Um, first of all, we've just said that these states are the states that constitute my attracting set given I am me. Therefore, they are valuable. They are more likely uh, to occur, or you're more likely to find me in these states. So if I interpret this log probability as a potential energy um, or a value function, then all of these, uh, all this is these two equations is saying is that it will look as if I perceive an act in order to maximize my value. And we can read that or think of that in terms of reinforcement learning, optimal control theory in engineering. Or if I was an economist, it could be uh, expected utility theory. So that's nice because the negative of this value is known as self-information and information theory, also known as surprisal or more simply surprise. Um, that means we can also interpret this gradient flow in terms of minimizing surprise or maximizing mutual information or the Infamax principle, also articulated in terms of the minimum redundancy principle and indeed the free energy principle. The free energy gets into the game by providing an approximate uh, an approximate um, equality or bound on this surprise here. And I'll unpack that just before we finish the presentation, exactly what goes into this free energy. But for the moment, it's just effectively how surprising are these states given I am me. The average of this free energy or the surprise or self-information is known as, as entropy in information theory, which just means that action and perception will look as if I'm trying to minimize the dispersion of my states by resisting things like the second law if it applied to open systems. And of course, this is the holy grail of self-organization read as the understanding of non-equilibrium or far from equilibrium steady states, um, as say articulated by Herman Haken in the, uh, the physics sense of synergetics. And if I was a physiologist, this would just be a statement of homeostasis. It's just saying, I exist by keeping my essential variables within bounds and precluding uh, a dispersion um, or, and a dissipation of those states into regimes which would be uncharacteristic of me and um, not consistent with my continued physiological existence. There's a final interpretation here, which I'm going to leverage, and that's the kind of uh, interpretation a statistician would bring to the table. So she would interpret this as the probability of some sensory data given me where I become a model of the causes of my data, namely the external states. So this gradient flow is saying, um, I'm gonna be maximizing my model evidence. So neatly summarizes self-evidencing of the kind you'd seen in the Bayesian brain hypothesis, uh, particular examples such as evidence accumulation, and in particular predictive coding has been a, become a popular metaphor um, for neuronal dynamics. All I repeat in the service of maximizing model evidence, also known as marginal likelihood, because we've marginalized out uh, the causes of the external states um, or Bayesian filtering. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a very brief um, numerical simulation of this kind of um, dependency and dynamics um, with an emphasis on the relationship between the inside and the outside. And to do that, what we've done here is just simulated lots of little macromolecules that uh, um, are coupled to each other with strong repulsion and weak electrochemical attraction. And then we put them in a little potential well and let them bubble away like a, a, a synthetic primordial soup. And why have I done that? Well, the reason I've done that is that because I've written down the equations of motion, those um, influences um, implicit in those flow equations, I now know where a Markov blanket is of any given set of internal states. So um, what I've done here, what we have done here, is just identify a little set of eight internal states in blue, and then we can find the Markov blanket, which cons is constituted by the parents, the children, and the parents of the children, and that is now going to be divided into the active states in red and the sensory states in magenta. And what we see here is that the surface states are being sort of pushed into the external states in cyan in a way that emulates the behavior of a little viral particle or a little creature living in 
this um, at non-equilibrium steady state, wiggling away with this little tail here in this in this soup. So now I can perform all sorts of experiments on this of the kind that we do in neuroscience stimulation and uh, lesion experiments, um, and ask the question, is this Bayesian perspective, this statistical perspective on this fundamental aspect of self-organization induced just because there is a Markov blanket, a separation between the inside and the outside, is it evident, um, literally, is there any evidence for self-evidencing um, in this particular example? And it's relatively easy to show. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can pick this up very, very easily. Uh, so what we've done here is just take a, a linear mixture of the internal states that best predicts the motion or modes of motion of the external states. So if you're a neuroscientist, this would be a little bit like um, stimulating a neuronal response to visual motion, for example. And from just the internal states, we can work out the um, the Bayesian or the posterior probability distribution over the velocity or the flow of the external states. And in this example, the blue line is a prediction um, with its 90% Bayesian credible intervals. And the cyan line is actually what's going on out there. Um, effectively, map, uh, creating a map or leveraging a, a, a map, a synchronization manifold between the inside and the outside that is communicated through these sensory and active states here. Uh, and just to point out that if I time locked this simulated uh, behavior of this little virus to these excursions or peaks as things happen on the outside, um, then we get something that looks very similar to uh, what we see in neurophysiology. This actually comes from uh, the brain of a, um, a monkey whilst looking at uh, moving objects in its uh, um, visual field. Um, the reason I'm showing this and the reason I've labeled one way of characterizing the relationship between the inside and the outside in terms of um, a, a synchronization manifold um, is um, what we're looking at here has been known for centuries. Um, it's just an instance of something called generalized synchrony or synchronization of chaos. Um, and I'm sure most of you will have heard of this in terms of Christian Huygens observations that if you put two clocks uh, on the same beam or wall, that the only long-term solution is that they will come to oscillate in synchrony. And indeed, this is a little drawing from Huygens here um, with the two uh, clocks here and the beam. And from our point of view, we can regard one clock as a uh, the internal states and another clock as the external states and the beam um, constitutes the blanket states with the active and sensory components here. And I like this diagram because it, it really emphasizes the symmetry of this argument so that if you commit to this interpretation of generalized synchrony um, in terms of this Bayesian mechanics or self-evidencing, what it means is that the environment is actually also try, trying to infer you um, and seek evidence for itself in relation to how you use your environment. And there are all sorts of interesting discussions about what that would look like uh, in terms of niche construction and the like. Uh, but let's finish the physics part now. So what we've said effectively is that the existence of a particle implies a partition of systemic, i.e. systems, states into internal blanket, namely sensory and active, and external states that are hidden behind the Markov blanket. And because active states changed, but are not changed by external states, they're going to look as if they're reducing the entropy of the blanket states. And this means that action will appear to maintain the structural and functional integrity of the Markov blanket, which is one way of describing, for example, self-assembly in computational chemistry or in the life sciences, a very elemental kind of autopoiesis. Finally, internal states appear to infer, represent in some way, or be in synchrony with the hidden causes of sensory states by increasing Bayesian model evidence or marginal likelihood and actively influence those causes. And we refer to that as active inference for obvious reasons. So that's the story um, from the point of view of a physicist. What I'm going to do now is to repeat the story, but um, from the point of view of psychology and possibly philosophy. Um, 
And this story can be traced back to probably uh, days of Plato, um, emerged through Kant via Helmholtz into modern, uh, well, 20th century psychology and modern day um, understanding of uh, certainly in, uh, cognitive neuroscience. Um, I think nicely illustrated by this 16th century uh, oil painter famed for doing still lives that when viewed from a different perspective, give you a very different visual impression. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit, but now you see a face, the point he's making here is that you made that face. This is something that you have brought to the table as a better explanation for this particular pattern of sensory impressions on your um, on your retina in, in this case. So this speaks to the notion of perception as a constructive process, a process in which you are creating explanations for your sensory imp impressions, literally uh, fantasies that may or may not explain what's going on. And if they are good fantasies generated by your fantastic organ, your brain, um, then you've got the right explanation for the way that the world, or a sufficiently good explanation for the way the world is actually generating your sensations. Um, and this idea, I repeat, has got a, you know, a long, long history, I think, most beautifully articulated by Helmholtz, for example. Objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous mechanism. Again, they have to be imagined, they have to be on the inside in order to interpret the sensory impressions. And this is clearly very closely related to um, there is a perception as hypothesis testing of the kind uh, promoted by Richard Gregory, ideas that have been um, leveraged and formalized to great effect by people like Jeffrey Hinton, Peter Diane, and indeed uh, they came up with the Helmholtz machine, um, borrowing ideas from um, Richard Feynman's uh, formulation of uh, uh, variational free energy minimization in quantum electrodynamics, articulated in um, using Bayesian statistics. So let's just go back to Helmholtz's notion of impressions on the nervous system, which is, again is nice because it, it speaks directly to this the sensory sector of my Markov blanket. And if it's right that it always looks as if me on the inside is always trying to make sense of or infer, represent in terms of having Bayesian subpersonal probability distributions or Bayesian beliefs about external states, the causes of my sensations, it will feel as if I am trying to infer or work out or guess what caused these sensory impressions, these shadows on my sensory veil. Um, so how does that work? How would that work physiologically? How would that work in a computer or a mortal computer like the brain? Well, we already know the basic physics of it because the internal states are prescribed by this fundamental um, gradient flow that it inherits from the Helmholtz decomposition, uh, which just means that the internal states change in a way that um, can be described as a gradient flow on that value or, um, or a negative a gradient descent on the negative of that value, which is this variational free energy here. And what I've done here is just rearranged these terms and made the, um, the solenoidal part um, um, uh, correspond to something called prediction and the gradient part, a gradient flow on something called a prediction error. And the reason I've done that is this is a very simple expression of what people, uh, some people in the audience who do um, Kalman filtering will recognize. It can be interpreted as a prediction and an update. So in other words, if mu, my internal state stood in for best guesses or posterior expectations, about the state of the world outside, I can guess what's going to happen next. And that will be my prediction of the flow of um, the, um, the expectations about external states. And then my sensory impressions can be used to evaluate this free energy gradient. And I can update my prediction based upon this free energy gradient that is um, in the world of Bayesian filtering. Uh, called a prediction error. So what's a prediction error? What is this free energy gradient? Um, it's very simple. Imagine we had this sensory impression on our retina. and We had this expectation encoded by our internal states that it was caused by a howling dog. Uh, 
And if I had a generative model generated by G here um, that was able to generate what I would see, the predict what I would see, if I was right and it was indeed a howling dog, I can take my predictions of the generative model and compare them to what I'm actually sensing. And the prediction error is just the difference. It's just the mismatch between my actual sensations or sensory states and that predicted uh, given my implicit beliefs or expectations encoded by my internal states. And all this equation is saying is that this is then used to drive my internal state, so my neuronal activity, in a way that destroys these gradients, eliminates the prediction error and finds a free energy minimum. Um, so all we're saying is effectively um, these, this dynamics is effectively uh, a dynamics of uh, reducing prediction error. And when I do that, I've got a good enough explanation of the causes of my sensations. Note that we're only, we'll never actually know what's outside. Uh, we can only ever infer it because we will never have direct access to the outside. So in this instance, it was actually a cat causing the uh, sensory impressions. So that perspective, I think, is very useful because it means we forget about all the physics and free energy and just say, well, that means that all my perception, all my action is just in the game of minimizing prediction error. Uh, and I can understand perception as literally changing my mind, changing my brain states so that my predictions are more like my sensations. And we can understand that as perception. But there's another way of reducing prediction error. And that's to change my sensations to make them more like my predictions. And how do I change my sensations? Well, I just move. I can move my eyes. I can move my fingers. I can adjust my relationship to the external world and get some new sensations. And if I move in the right kind of way, I can fulfill my predictions simply because the sensations are now more like my predictions. So that reduces action to changing sensations so that they um, effectively fulfill my predictions. And that's one way of looking at, say, homeostasis. Um, another way of looking at that is um, in terms of um, neuronal message passing um, in the neurosciences. So I've just um, written this out, uh, giving you an example here for a, a particular reason um, to illustrate just some cardinal computational architectures and structures that emerge when you apply this kind of uh, Bayesian mechanics to generative models that generate these predictions of the sort that you would, might find in any deep architecture, and in particular here, the brain. Um, so let's just consider, say, retinal input, visual input. It comes into a, a subcortical region in the brain known as lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, these uh, visual inputs come in. They are compared with top-down predictions from primary visual cortex to produce a prediction error, and the prediction error is then passed up the hierarchy to revise the expectations. You can think of this um, in terms of statistics as Bayesian belief updating, such that the prediction errors are being minimized. But of course, these expectations um, themselves are being predicted. And so we have second order prediction errors that then drive the second order predictions and so on to any hierarchical depth that you want to consider. So that's the hierarchical aspect. Um, at the moment, we're just talking about perception. What about action? Well, imagine another kind of input, sensory input, proprioceptive input, basically the signals from my actuators, um, in this instance, the ocular motor system, that are telling me about the stretch of various muscles. And of course, I may have beliefs about what I should be feeling from my actuators, and those expectations can be used to form a prediction error that could be used to revise my beliefs about where my eyes are pointing. But there's a much simpler way in which I can destroy that prediction error or attenuate that prediction error. I can redirect those prediction errors back into the external world so that they contract the musculature so that the muscles now send the signals that I predicted. So what I've just described is just this gradient flow um, as pertaining to action. But if I was a, um, a, ne a neurobiologist or a motor physiologist, I've just described a classical reflex arc, the kind of servo that you would see in robotics, for example. And all it means is that now the predictions are being used to set the 
um, the fixed points that I would realize by using this closed loop um, control. Um, and notice that it is um, effectively closed loop at this peripheral level, but in a sense, the predictions are being informed by this deep hierarchical processing. So the predictions are actually informed by many, many different modalities, but they're actually enacted simply by boiling it down, reducing it to predictions about how much you're going to move around. So um, let me just give you an example of that, and then we'll close with a, the twist I promised you um, at the beginning of the talk. Um, so this is the, you know, if you like, the overall anatomy of computation that's emerged from um, out of this Bayesian reading of self-organization or self-evidencing. We've got stuff on the outside. It generates sensory inputs. These sensory inputs are used uh, to um, minimize a variational free energy functional of internal expectations or beliefs um, and the sensory inputs to produce a good ex uh, b b uh, posterior or approximate posterior belief probability distribution over the external states, about external states, usually denoted by Q. And then we use our Bayesian beliefs about external states to predict basically what would happen well, in fact, we're going to see uh, see that um, later on to predict um, the um, to generate prediction errors in a way that enables action to eliminate proprioceptive prediction errors that um, in turn minimize the free energy in an active way via action selection. And then I um, act upon the world. The world changes. It generates more um, sensations, and so the cycle uh, continues. And this is quite a you know an expressive framework in which you can simulate all sorts of interesting things. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, it actually illustrates that um, this divorce between what's going on inside your head and what's going on on the outside. In this particular example, the beliefs and the generative model are much more complicated than what's actually going on on the outside. So in effect, this synthetic agent in this simulation is actually authoring her own sensorium and actually causing things that didn't exist before she thought they were there. So a nice example of fulfilling the um, self-fulfilling pro prophecies or predictions uh, generated by a an autonomous or a dynamic generative model. And the, autonomic, uh, the autonomy here inherits from the fact that this agent, her generative model, thinks that there's some abstract itinerant dynamics, a central pattern generator, actually um, modeled with a Volterra, um, not uh, Lotka Volterra system here. And she further believes that this abstract motion is driving some invisible point in her extra personal space. And furthermore, there's an invisible spring between this point and the end of her finger. So what she thinks is going on is an invisible point is pulling her finger around. So she expects to feel her finger moving and expects to see her finger moving. And um, because she's got reflexes and she predicts to feel her finger moving, it actually moves in the way that she predicts. So, and that satisfies the, the visual predictions, which we can interpret in this instance as coronary discharge, um, as would be articulated in, uh, in neurophysiology. So these descending proprioceptive predictions are realized by action, and then they supply the predicted visual input. And we can simulate um, here a little example uh, of handwriting J and A. And then we can go back in and say, well, what would this look like if I was a physiologist looking at the activity of these representations, say, into this uh, um, representation or internal state, neural state here? And what I've done here is just plotted every time the activity exceeds half the maximum threshold as a function of where the finger is in space. And what we show here, what we evince here, is something which is very canonical in electrophysiology, effectively a sort of place field selectivity that also, incidentally, in this instance, it shows a directional selectivity. It's only active when the J on the downstroke of the J and not the upstroke. Um, with this very simple simulation, we can play a, a trick on the agent. 
um, and actually remove the proprioceptive uh, sensations completely, but replay the visual input. So from the agent's perspective, it's as if she's seeing a finger move, but she can't feel it. So it's like somebody else's finger is moving. Um, but of course, her generative model is completely apt to predict the visual input. And, um, and therefore, when we replay the visual input, we activate exactly the same representations or units in the synthetic brain. Um, and this is um, another really interesting cardinal feature of certain parts of um, the active inference machinery in our brains, namely a mirror neuron-like response that the same machinery is used to generate our own behavior as is used to actually make sense of the same kind of behavior, but committed by somebody else, namely action observation. So that's nice, and it, it just rests, or if you like, um, emerges from um, the Markov blanket and uh, you know, certain kinds of dynamics that um, are entailed by a generative model under this dependency structure. What I want to do in closing now is to make one simple move and move to a much more complex uh, or sophisticated kind of action. Um, so what I'm going to do is just remove the um, the access of the internal states to one's own action. So now in a deep model, the internal states can't see, they don't know what the active states are doing. And if I do that, we have a very different kind of structure. In effect, what happens is that the active states become hidden behind or hidden from the internal states and start to play the role of causes of my sensory inputs. So I, now I have this unusual situation, or perhaps counterintuitive situation, where my own actions have to be inferred as random variables. I'm having to infer what I am doing because I can't directly sense what I am doing. I can only infer what I'm doing through the sensory consequences. And this leads to an interpretation uh, of the space and mechanics that's not just about how sensations are caused by external states, but how they are caused by external states upon which I am acting, and therefore I have beliefs about my action. You can think of this in terms of planning as inference, which leads to a, a slightly more elaborated and deeper kind of structure where we've got the same thing, thing going on before perceptual inference minimizing the variational free energy, uh, and action selection basically trying to fulfill the predictions of the beliefs under a free energy minimized posterior over external states. But now I've also got to um, deal with beliefs about action. Um, and the way that I written that down here is to condition my beliefs about what's going on on the outside on any particular plan or action or policy or narrative um, that I specify, and then provide a prior over the actions um, that turns out to, to have some really interesting interpretations. We call this an expected free energy um, for the following reason, that um, when I'm actually in the moment, then the free energy is a functional of real sensory variables, not random variables. But of course, in the future, those variables are no longer real variables. So they become random variables because they have yet to be observed. So I now have to take an expectation of the free energy um, under a posterior predictive uh, distribution or density um, over my predicted sensory state. And that expectation gives you this expected free energy. So what what what, what is that? Uh, these, this is the equation that I, uh, I forewarned you about. Um, and I repeat, I'm just showing it to illustrate this I think very compelling mathematical symmetry between the ways that you'd interpret a variational free energy and the ways that you'd interpret an expected free energy that underwrites plans and intentions and choices that consider the consequences of my action. So this is the full expression for the variational free energy. Um, I've written it in two ways which you would recognize if you come from different specialities. If you're a statistician, you'll recognize this as uh, basically an accuracy term, a log um, likelihood term um, expected, expected under your uh, beliefs about the causes of or ex explanatory variables, the external states of some sensory data um, that is equipped with a complexity, which is a KL divergence. 
So what we're saying is that the the um, the e evidence maximizing marginal max uh, likelihood maximizing behavior entailed by this free energy principle in, uh, will make it look as if we're trying to find the most accurate account of our sensory input that is as simple as possible. So minimizing that complexity term here, which is just the difference between our posterior and our prior, scoring how much we had to change our mind in order to provide that accurate account. But if I just rearrange these two terms, I have another KL divergence and this term here, which is just the surprise or the value. So um, in this instance, the value just is the log evidence. And because this divergence can be never less than zero, we now can see why the free energy is a bound approximation to log evidence. Um, and indeed, it's actually called an evidence bound or um, the negative free energy is an evidence lower bound. And you'll find in machine learning, uh, it is exactly the objective function you say in variational autoencoders. Um, but what I want to do is just ask, well, what would happen if we took the expectation of this functional form over the posterior predictive density over the outcomes in the future given a particular action? So now I have an expected free energy functional of action. And what happens is that complexity and accuracy become risk and ambiguity respectively. And the divergence and log evidence become what I've called here intrinsic and extrinsic value. So why? Why have I chosen those uh, labels? Well, um, let's just focus on the intrinsic value. Let's assume we have um, a generative model where there are no prior preferences. There are no um, prior beliefs about my characteristic states. I'm happy with anything. Uh, there are no rewards. There are no goals. Um, uh, and we're just left with this term. So what is this term? Well, this is actually a KL divergence, a, a measure, a score of the difference between two probability distributions. And the particular difference here is between my beliefs about what's going on outside, given what I would see if I saw, if I took this action, relative to my beliefs in the absence of that sensory information. So it scores the information gain afforded by this action. It's the epistemic affordance. It's the expected information gained as a function of pursuing this action, palpating the world in this way as opposed to that way. And in the visual search literature, this is known as Bayesian surprise. And you can see, well, if you're um, um, fluent with this, um, uh, with um, probability theory, you'll see immediately that this is also just a mutual information. It's just a mutual information between the causes and consequences, namely the external causes and the sensory consequences that will be revealed by taking this particular action or realized by taking this particular action. What I'm going to do now is just take various kinds of uncertainty off the table and see where we end up. And I'm going to start by um, ignoring any uncertainty about the outside, given my sensory input. So I'm now going to say I can see the entire world. So there's no ambiguity. There's no expected um, uh, expected inaccuracy. That what I see is what is out there. And so S's and the external states become interchangeable. And I'm left with this thing. And this is another KL divergence. And this time I'm going to try and reduce it. Um, and it's a KL divergence between what I expect to happen on the outside or indeed what I sense and what a, pri a priori I prefer, my prior beliefs about my characteristic states, the things I think should happen or will happen to me, given who I am. And of course, if I'm minimizing this, what I'm going to do is to choose those actions that minimize the difference between what I anticipate and what I prefer. And in engineering, that's known as KL control. Um, in economics, you could read this in terms of a, a risk sensitive control because this is a risk term that discounts the ambiguity. And finally, let me take um, the last kind of reducible uncertainty off the table and say there's no intrinsic value, there's no epistemic affordance. I'm so used to this environment, I know everything. I don't need to do any more exploration um, and I commit completely to exploitation, which just here 
rests upon the extrinsic value. And because we know that this extrinsic value um, is, which is just the expected log evidence, um, is can uh, be read in terms of value or utility, what we're saying is that we're just going to choose those actions that maximize the expected utility, and hence we get the expected utility theory. So we've come from um, sort of an information-seeking explorative imperative afforded by this expected uh, um, free energy to simple reinforcement learning, expected utilitarian approaches. Um, but we had to do that to get there. We've had to uh, effectively discount all kinds of reducible uncertainty. So the information seeking part gives way to the more instrumental pragmatic affordances um, specified by, by, by prior beliefs. So I'll just close with a, a numerical simulation of what kind of behavior um, can be evinced um, with, by focusing on this information seeking, expected inform information gain, maximizing um, imperative that um, is realized through this kind of planning as inference based upon the expected free energy, which if we ignore the expensive value just becomes this base and surprise or this salience when we regard, for example, the action of where do I look next? So. If I want to minimize my expected free energy or maximize my expected information gain, I am basically going to look to the most salient parts of my visual field. And indeed, you can uh, illustrate that um, numerically. Um, in this example, what we've done is so that we can only see a little bit of this image. How much information would we have that resolves uncertainty about the hypothesis that this image was caused by uh, this um, uh, visual object here? And then we can just move this circle around and score the salience of the expected free energy and create a salience map. And indeed, the salience map does indeed um, account for the kind of um, saccadic plans or actions or saccadic eye movements shown by um, human subjects. This is from the classic work of Yarbus. And we can simulate that um, um, again by just um, creating a, a, a very simple agent who um, uh, is now equipped with this planning as inference, with this sort of uh, belief structure over her own actions that in this instance are just a, a where to look um, um, in terms of scanning uh, an image of visual face. This agent's universe is very simple. The face can either be upright, sideways or inverted. Um, and again, she can only um, sample in a smart way, some very small part or sparse data and has to choose carefully where to look next to get the most disambiguating um, information that maximizes this, this uh, information gain to, to resolve her uncertainty about what's going on. And this is what she chooses. She chooses to look at, uh, largely around the eyes and the nose with occasional um, saccades of the forehead to make sure it's not an inverted face because the mouth would be up there if it was an inverted face. And this is the um, time dependent changes in the uh, salience map that it nicely illustrate that the salience depends upon my beliefs. So my next, the next best, best action depends upon my beliefs about states of the world, not states of the world per se. And this is what she sees. And these are, this is cartooning the um, resolution of uncertainty about the correct hypothesis uh, that she concludes that she is looking at an upright phase. So that's um, the end of a numerical illustration of, of this epistemic foraging, this um, exploratory aspect to Bayes' optimal behavior, uh, technically um, um, could be understood in terms of the principles of optimum Bayesian experimental design, in contrast to the other part, which is the uh, optimal uh, Bayesian decision theoretic part based upon some loss function or prior preferences or utility. Um, so I'm going to close by um, quoting from Helmholtz again, who um, much more succinctly can summarize what I've been saying for the past 10 minutes. Um, each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we have understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us. That is their existence in definite spatial relations. Uh, and with that, it only remains uh, for me to thank those ideas, uh, sorry, those people whose ideas I've been talking about, and of course, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Dr. Friston. We'll open it up to some questions now from the audience. Yes. Um, can you hear me all right? I'll have to repeat it. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, basically, how does the, the model learn for a field like all the uh, Like, you know, the gap is recognized for the class of stimulus, but you also have to recognize what class of stimulus is for both. So, do you mind if I summarize that? Sure. Uh, how does the model learn to adapt and to generalize? Is... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your summary was much shorter than the question. <laughs> I hope we haven't lost any nuances, but it's an excellent question. Um, so I thought this might happen. Uh, the, 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 this base, the, this talk was just about the you know the basics uh, or Bayesian mechanics. Um, and its focus was just on latent states that change very quickly, states of the world. But exactly the same maths um, applies to um, the parameters of the generative model and the structure of the generative model. So I think if you just think of that kind of mechanics but playing out much more slowly, you can now um, derive the equivalent um, belief updating um, equations for the parameters of a generative model. And when you do that under... Um, actually both continuous and discrete state space uh, state space models, you get something that looks identical in functional form to a associative plasticity, um, you know, say a Hebbian kind of plasticity with associative and, and decay terms. So at the level of adapting the generative model to a particular environment, you now move from fast inference of the kind that I was to, uh, demonstrating and planning as inference um, at a fast time scale to the same kind of mechanics, but um, you'd look at that as learning. So this would be the kind of learning that you know is uh, much more the focus of machine learning. You know, even in the context of learning to infer, for example, in a, um, a variational autoencoder, um, learning the the weights on the encoder and the decoder. Those effectively are updating uh, or learning the parameters, and that takes lots and lots of um, fast data in order to do that rather slow updating. Exactly the same maths actually applies to the very structure of the model itself. So, um, you know, let's say that we're trying to um, optimize a variational autoencoder, and we've optimized its weight with some big data um, um, implicitly um, uh, underwriting the inference. Um, encoded by the, the variation auto encoder, but now I wanted to optimize its structure. And, you know, do I use twelve or eight layers? What kind of um, um, nonlinear um, functions do I do I use? Uh, and one way of doing that, if you're a, a, a you know a Bayesian statistician, is to evaluate the free energy as a proxy for or a bound on the marginal likelihood of the model evidence, and then rehearse the whole process of optimizing the weights of the variation auto encoder and then score each structure in terms of its marginal likelihood or model evidence by comparing the free energies with the same data. And then you select the best structure and then you know, uh, and then repeat. And, and I use the, all those words um, deliberately because of course you can look at natural selection as basically Bayesian model selection um, in the sense that natural selection is in the game of trying to find those models that have the maximum marginal likelihood, um, basically the you know, that are most populous, and thereby provide evidence that they are a good fit to their particular external states or their particular particular eco niche or environment. It's exactly the same kind of maths, and indeed you can you can actually show that um, say replicated dynamics is has the same functional form as a, a Bayesian filter, and the Bayesian filter is just one instance of of this kind of um, um, evidence accumulation um, or evidence maximizing uh, maximizing procedure that can be deployed very quickly or it can be deployed very, very slowly. So the answer to the question about adaptation and morphology and structure learning um, is really um, um, an acknowledgement and a celebration that the same principles can be deployed at many different scales and in so celebrating, make the important point that each temporal scale provides an important context and is informed by the scale below. So you can't do good inference unless you've got good learning, but of course you can't learn unless you're doing good inference. In the same way, you can't do good structure learning unless you've got the right parameters 
but you can't get the right parameters until you've got the right structure. So there's a circular dependency ac across these scales. Uh, and it's sometimes very useful to, to recognize that if you've forgotten that there are other scales uh, going on at the same time. Right. We'll take the next question um, from Zoom. Uh, Nathan, go ahead. Hello, Dr. Friston. Um, I would like to piggyback on a discussion that you had with Lex Friedman and kind of take it a little further. You're discussing um, how your tools of inquiry or maybe your approach as a neuroscientist might be based on certain beliefs you have. Um, but uh, the question I want to ask is, um, um, well, because like in this audience, we have a lot of established, you know, neuroscientists, and psychologists, and on the other end, we have younger folk like me who want to go into neuroscience. Um, how might someone, you know, young like me, how should I go about forming my beliefs, um, which might, uh, w which might dictate how I uh, educate myself and, you know, hope to discover more about the brain? Yeah, that's my question. Well, <laughs> yes. I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, um, or perhaps I am uh, in the sense that I suspect the answer um, is something that um, reflects my own career. I think you have to keep your options open and make sure you get a, a broader foundational training as you can. And if you believe that um, sort of if you want if you want to do, say, artificial intelligence research or look where is machine uh, learning heading in, in the in the in the spirit of artificial intelligence um then i think most people would say well it, it's going to become more biomimetic and possibly some people would argue it has to be if it's going to survive or we are or we are going to survive uh, together um which basically means it would be really nice if you had a good foundational training in both the neurosciences and machine learning and if you can um either statistics or probability theory and or physics uh, and I've noticed that some younger people are also now getting into sort of um, things like category theory as, as sort of a, you know, a, a pure math that might be applied and might be useful in this kind of thing. So my my advice is to just try and take every opportunity to keep your church as broad as possible. And then you can see, you can join the dots later in life and sort of commit to a particular focus or a particular application. Thank you. Thank you for coming out and talking to us. My pleasure. We have a question from the audience. Uh, just a, a, a comment before my question. As, as an old guy, um, what he just said is exactly right <laughs> about uh, keep your options open and study as much stuff as you can and learn a lot that's in some way or not relevant to what you're doing. That's very cool. <laughs> um, so if I've understood correctly, um, in order to plan an action, you have to um, uh, disconnect uh, active states from internal states and hence from perceptual states. Uh, but there's um, quite a bit, well, in my limited knowledge, there's quite a bit of imaging evidence that suggests that when you plan an action, a whole lot of perceptual portions of brain and action portions of brain get activated. And if you imagine actually carrying out that action, even more of it, um, not out to the periphery because you're not actually acting, you're not actually perceiving, but a whole lot of brain stuff that looks like in your theoretical account ought to be divorced from the planning actions uh, and imagining actions end up getting activated. So how do you put all that stuff together? Where are the boundaries on planning versus um, actually acting as far as the brain is concerned? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. You know, sort of... Um, Perhaps you could argue that sort of most of the frontal lobe is dedicated to this kind of planning as inference and you know and get into um notions of simulation theory and uh you know what is working memory other than um um uh you know bearing in mind all the context that you need to plan what to do next and is working memory just a retrospective aspect of prospective memory, which is another way of looking looking at planning. You could even start to think about sort of um 
replay and preplay uh, in the electrophysiological studies of, of, of rodents, for example, uh, along these lines. Uh, in answer to your question, I would all of the functional anatomy that you uh, just described, I would ascribe to the internal states that are um, very uh, quite a long way away from the Markov blanket states that that, that, that I had in mind. Um, so the Markov blanket states are literally um, those uh, the sensory receptors in in the retina or you know um, all the all the sensory organs and the active states are uh, right down in the spinal cord um, and um, you know are just those cells that are the originator of the um, uh, the drives to the neuromuscular uh, neuromuscular junction. So that sequestration or separation is is really out in the periphery. It's not. In, it's still in the central nervous system, but it, it's down in down down in the spinal cord. Um, is you know from the point of view of a motor physiologist, um, then uh, presents the very difficult, the, the very delicate issue of how you protect your actuators, your sort of um, those classical reflex arcs in the you know in the dorsal or mediated by uh, by all the wiring in, in the spinal cord. How do you protect that from all the planning and machinations going on um, in the uh, cerebrum, possibly also the um, the cerebellum? Um, and my guess is that this is what gamma uh, motor neuro uh, motor neurons do, that the, the gain control that there's a lot of sensory attenuation or attenuation of various signals um, that um, either permit the expression of reflexes or attenuate those, those reflexes, depending upon whether you're actually acting or contemplating uh, contemplating an action. Um, you know, just if I may, just because I, I, I think this is a really useful example um, of um, the separation not in terms of the functional anatomy and the hierarchical depth of cortical and subcortical hierarchies, but in time, a lovely example of this sort of separation between action and planning um, is saccadic eye movements. So that, you know, every 250 milliseconds, we commit to a saltatory movement and action. And in so doing, then provide us with some information and then we keep our eyes roughly still ignoring microsis cards for a further 200 milliseconds while we do all the processing and planning for the next action and then we emit the next action and you know so on the cycle so we have this very saltatory evidence gathering as we build up pictures of what's going on the nice thing about that though is um, in order to act i have to attenuate the evidence that my eyes are not moving so i have to suspend the um if you like the attention or the gain um or the precision of the likelihood mapping from my the consequences of my action just to allow the movement and that's you know um, what i'm describing here is so um, saccadic suppression the fact you can't see anything while your eyes are actually moving so that's another kind of separation but not in the anatomy uh, but in the sort of temporal scheduling of this sort of um this dance between you know acting on a plan and the act of uh, and the um the internal acts of planning per se does does that make sense yeah he says yes yeah yeah he says okay okay good uh we'll take one more question from paul and zoom please hi there thank you so much um my question is about actions and preferences um, in particular, so I think touching especially on some of the last slides. So um, I, I might need to, uh, to ask for clarification or the summary might be um, inaccurate, but as I understand it, um, on the action front, we're trying to minimize the prediction error between sort of what we would like the world to be like and um, what uh, it is in fact like by taking action in different ways. Now, of course, certain states that we might aspire to might have, might have high expected value um, as opposed to sort of uh, intrinsic value and we try to bring those about. But it, it seems that there is a question um, further about that, where is, which is how, which, where does, do the standards of evaluation come from to start with? What counts as sort of the desirable states and maybe especially in humans, how do we end up with that? What counts as success on a basic level on your picture? Yeah, no, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
as a physicist, um, technically, the answer is basically just that uh, pullback attractor. So if I know the kind of thing that you are and I want to simulate you, I I, I just work out or I can enumerate um, the probability of occupying any point in a parameter or state space. And then that becomes your prior preference. And then I plug that in as a generative model into those update schemes. So once I know the generative model and I um, have any sensory consequences, um, I can evaluate the free energy gradients and I can simulate you just by you know, solving those differential equations. And that's basically a, a summary of why the free energy principle is useful. It's just useful for simulating um, characteristic behaviours that are characteristic of the generative model. So as a physicist, you just start with the generative model as a probabilistic description of the kind of states that um, you find this thing in. I think the deeper question, though, is uh, you know, where where does that come from? Um, and it comes from, um, um, it, it comes, well, the answer would be, I think, very much like the first answer. You, you, you have to um, remember that these processes are nested um, in a uh, scale um, invariant like fashion with the separation of temporal scales. So, you know, from the point of view for, let's take, let's take learning, you know, where do, where do we learn our priors? Well, we learn our priors um uh, during your development we, we we could also learn our our priors um um at a much faster you know so over minutes and hours during our sort of sleep wake cycle and the like um so those preferences are not if you like immutable they're in you know they, they are learnable they are technically empirical priors so you can condition your preferences on the context um and in fact, people actually do this quite a lot in terms of simulating um, games um, or interpersonal dynamic interactions. So, you know, a simple or um, anthropomorphic example of this is um, how do I expect myself to behave in this situation? And what is this situation? I look around, I simulate the evidence, and I infer, oh, I am giving a presentation to scientists on the other side of the world. Um, and... I would have a certain set of preferences or expectations about the outcomes of my behavior conditioned upon this is what the kind of thing I am at the moment, which might be very different than if I was arguing with my son as a father or you know, you know, in, me in another context. So you can condition those preferences on um, latent states and you can infer the kind of context you're in and you will have state dependent preferences. They can also be learned. Um, and you can, you know, if I see myself doing this time and time again, or I see my mother doing this kind of thing time and time again as an infant, and I have the belief that I am a thing like my mother, then I will come to inherit her preferences. And of course, you can take that argument right through to sort of cultural niche construction as expressed in terms of things like evolution psychology. So I think I think the answer would be, you know, technically these are empirical prize there, but therefore they are learnable. Uh, and who teaches them? Well, it's the context in which you're doing your inference and learning. Where does that come from? Well, it can come from, you know, your mother, right? or it could come from the person writing your code, or it could come from evolution. It just depends upon what time scale um, you, you want to invoke or, you know, the kind of... Um, instantiating and learning and contextualizing those priors that define i repeat simply what i expect something like me to uh, to encounter um in terms of the outcomes conditioned upon the particular action or narrative that i'm pursuing at the moment well sir one more <laughs> uh, so you mentioned a number of um of essentially cost functions that are related to minimizing inference error. And it, it seems that some brain regions, some subsystems uh, are actually minimizing multi-objective cost functions. For example, a, a different type of energy, just the energy that is derived from food, chemical energy use. And I'm wondering, has it been your experience that uh, it's typical for brain subsystems to have multi-objective cost functions or costs and constraints mixed. And if so, if there's a lot of commonality between <laughs> different costs uh, that are being optimized across different uh, brain subsystems. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a, re it's a really good point. Um, so one of the reasons I used the phrase empirical prize before, another way of reading empirical prize is just some 
surprise that sit or some probability distributions that sit in a hierarchical model. So as soon as you say empirical prior, you're talking about a hierarchical model. And of course, you can have preferences at each level of that hierarchy, which I think is, is what you're saying. But you're also saying it couldn't be any other way. In fact, you know, there is no single, um, if you like, um, uh, dimension or channel um, or state that is equipped with with the prior preference. There are as many um, preferences and loss functions and implicit cost functions as there are latent states in, in your generative model, or at least the outcomes um, um, from the point of view of the level above in a hierarchical generative model. So it's a really important point. It's exactly the same mechanics at each point in the hierarchy, uh, but they are um, being constrained by different loss functions. The other key point you've just made, which I should have made earlier, really, um, um, is that uh, unlike um, reinforcement learning, where you've got one privileged outcome right at the bottom, which is labelled reward, and sometimes it's only actually giving you useful information very sporadically in terms of sort of you know distant time horizon problems, um, the, the 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 formulation of preferences and costs in this um in this scheme uh, in active inference um is um um highly multidimensional i repeat every state space and every outcome that you can that co it, that constitutes a generative model can be equipped with a prior preference um, now, most of them are going to be very uninformative priors, so you don't know they're there. And a few of them will have very, very precise priors on. And those few ones that have very, very precise priors on are the ones that constrain their expected free energy. They're the loss functions that really make a difference in terms of what I choose to do. And they would be exactly the examples you, you mentioned, um, that I have a prior expectation that my um, blood glucose level lies between this millimolar concentration and that millimolar concentration. And, when, you know, and I will now build generative models, very subpersonal ones, that will um, invoke either autonomic reflexes, say releasing um, insulin um, in a homeostatic way. And as I get older, I will start to build more allostatic, deeper generative models that allow me to actually um, avoid situations of hypoglycemia by regularly eating, for example, or I may be fed by, by my mother in a, in a more distributed cognition sense. Um, so the, 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 the real, the, the important point here is that all the preferences are extremely high dimensional um, and they're always there. It's just we only really talk about the ones that we have precise prize over. And of course, we can learn the precision of, of those prize. The reason that's an important um, observation is that it takes you and gives you a very different perspective on Bayes optimal behavior. It's not about optimizing some monolithic one-dimensional utility function, say reward or money. It's actually about satisfying multiple constraints. So it's probably much easier to think about um, the imperatives for the pragmatic intrinsic part of um, uh, planning as inference or policy selection um, in terms of satisfying multiple constraints. And the reason I express that in terms of constraints there's a lovely link between the free energy principle and James's maximum entropy principle under constraints. So he also, uh, or James, would also look at the imperatives for um, inference and measurement as finding those beliefs that have the greatest entropy, but under constraints. And those constraints are exactly those provided by the generative model that includes those prior, prior preferences. So it may well be better to, you know, it, had I given the presentation by referring to them as uh, constraint functions or loss functions, then you may not have had to worry about asking your question, but it's a great question to ask. Thanks very much. All right, thank you again, Dr. Friston. It was an honor having you speak with us and um, thank you very much again. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Right, thanks, Do you have to point it out to anyone who RSVP uh, with email or